Thank you so much, Rajesh. Um, I have to begin by saying that it's an absolute honor to be here today um, for various reasons. I'm here with two people who I respect very, very highly, and I uh, look up to the work that they're doing and as people and as practitioners, and I'm very glad to be in conversation with the two of them. Um, I think what's also interesting is that a lot of us have been hounding Rajesh to get going with this book and we want to look at it. We've, uh, some of us have contributed to it. So we're very happy and excited that it's finally here and uh, all of us can get our copies. I've got one copy in front of me right now, which is very exciting. So I encourage everyone to get theirs uh, very soon. Um, and what I'm also very excited about is the fact that we're talking about something that's extraordinary. Uh, we're talking about the unbuilt. There, of course, in the, in the book itself, there have been multiple projects that have been uh, showcased from designers and practitioners across the country. Um, but what's also fascinated me are some of the essays that have been written. Um, and like Rajesh mentioned, these essays have kind of taken off on various tangents and, and pulled various threads of the idea of what is unbuilt, um, what could unbuilt mean, and how it's interpreted differently by different people, right? So I would like to kickstart this conversation this evening with Gautam and uh, Ramu today. Unfortunately, of course, uh, Vijay can't join us, but um, Gautam and Ramu, I want to start by asking you, how do each of you interpret the idea of the unbuilt? What does that particular term mean to you and your practice? Ramu, would you like to start? Well, it's... Uh, let me just think for a minute, but because it is a complex question you've asked me. Uh, because having been through the book, the first reaction is that there is a great deal of sort of projects that are very much that could have been built. I mean, they are very, very strong in that direction. The book is full of projects. Although they aren't built, they're very much uh, possibility of building them is, is very, very good. Uh, my first reaction was that uh, one sh should have thought about perhaps looking at buildings that may never have been built. You know, the ones that have been put in the book can easily be built, most of them, I think. Some of them can't be, but, uh, but most of them do have the possibility. So, uh, so I would have liked perhaps uh, a little look at the... Uh, the idea of of doing something quite as as uh, Rajesh was saying in the third book, where he's going to invite sculptors and other people, uh, non-architects, and that would have been quite interesting because then we would really look at the unbuilt in a more uh, a different way. And this is what I would like to discuss as the, as this meeting goes on. So maybe Gautam will have a few thoughts on this. I think it's interesting because Gautam talks about this. He talks about more about what is the potential to be built, right, Gautam? And you're talking a lot about what can be built, not necessarily in terms of what were lost opportunities, but what can be built in the future. Uh, yes, um, Rani. I think, you know, uh, I maybe saw this in a way which uh, was uh, the, uh, the idea of the unbuilt, certainly fueled by the pandemic. Uh, to, to make a realization of the unbuilt possible. Mm -hmm. But that's not always, uh, you know, not always the case uh, in India. Um, my own uh, um, sense of what the unbuilt, um, what I'd like to see as unbuilt and what uh, I think Ramu is also describing, that, that uh, we are really, uh, the whole point of looking at the unbuilt is to is to create a sort of strategy for a very different future, and and I think if if we if we allow uh, the our own private projects to uh, take take hold as a potential for for making future things, we have to start looking I think very differently at what uh, you know what how we treat design because. You hear me? Uh, Your voice seems to be breaking. It seems between. to be troublesome. Yeah. You know, so, so uh, when I was when I was looking at the book, uh, the book seemed to to suggest that we were looking really at private projects which had uh, which were not built for a certain reason. 
Uh, and of course, these are all very bits of far reaching and they look really to, to ways of doing things. But um, I, I think someone, uh, I think maybe it was Samir, who said that uh, building the unbuilt is is really where where it's at, and I think we we need to make uh, sure that uh, that ideas are just not expressed, but the ideas are expressed with the potential of, of them being built. And so I think it's uh, it is very important to to look at ideas, uh, but not just to leave them in a book. I mean, this is a it's a very important book, but it's uh, uh, its real value is that we see the possibility of each of these being built at some future date. And it's like, um, you know, it's like uh, music which is written. And, you know, unless you hear the piece of music, it, uh, it has no real value. So I think our whole point of doing uh, unbuilt projects or, or recording unbuilt projects is to see that, you know, how does the future hold for... Uh, for those very projects and what what can we uh, they may not be, be built just as they are but there is a germ of a suggestion that uh, that will carry them into a future and a very different future i think i think it's interesting that you said that uh, gautam but i also want to like, you know kind of set a premise for the conversation where a lot of people say that especially the future of building and the future of architecture or they question the future of architecture right and they say that the, the best building is the one that's already been built. And there's this entire discussion about, should we be building more? Should we not be building more? Um, on the other hand, as a profession, that's what we're meant to be doing. We're meant to be building. And we're, that's, that's the service that we provide. Um, so in light of this, considering that both of you are practicing architects and you're actively building, how does this idea of the unbuilt or the unbuilding feature in your work personally or does it? I, I think to answer that, please, sorry. Sir. Please, Rama, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, uh, I was going to answer the question by in a different manner because uh, the unbuilt is something that we would talk about anyway. But what is the, one of the features of the book that I occurred to me greatly was that all these buildings, as Gautam said, can be built. Uh, some of them, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but some of them could well have been sort of castles in the air, as it were, that could not be built, even structurally or otherwise. You know, there's one, I think, with lots of holes. Now, I was wondering whether those will, uh, those could have been included as buildings that cannot be built. But what I was really going to raise at this forum was that uh, many of the buildings, and this has been something that I've always wanted to say, is that have been derived in the so-called modernistic style, the, mo the modern world of architecture. Uh, I, what I what is, is that a place like Shantaniketan was founded the same year as the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus for some reason is now defunct and yet its influence on the international style and even today's unbuilt work, which we see in this book, is very strong. And my question is whether, as Gautam was saying, could we diverse, uh, diversify our own thinking towards ideologies of building, that why should we follow the international style? Why should we not now start looking at the other possibilities of building? And this is a good moment to do it because the international side has almost played itself out. So this is a question I wanted to raise at this meeting. Gautam, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the point that Ramu is making is very valid, but my own, own view is, uh, is that, that we need to begin to think of architecture very differently. And uh, that I think comes from the, uh, stems partly from the fact that clients have very clear uh, outline briefs, which give you details of uh, specifications of site and of, uh, of the exact uh, amount of area they're looking for. So I, I, what I find is that 
in most cases you are sort of stymied and stuck in a in a in a sort of rut where you where you just need to get away from following rules and i think as a culture we have followed rules for so long it is also very important to break away and and to create a new set of rules and and i think we see this in many parts of the world where there where they're constantly breaking rules and and the rules are broken with the intention of making something better not just for a distant future but for an immediate future i mean there is a there is a, a variance committee in uh, in uh, new york which allows uh, builders to uh, to add say four floors to their their building if they release the bottom two floors to uh, as as a public plaza and uh, uh, you know that that's actually something which is done immediately it's not something that we we put in a rule book and say that in future four more uh, flows would be allowed and these variances are the ones which begin to create a different kind of future for architecture the minute you see that that a rule has been broken you are aware that uh, there is potential to do something which is which is very different from the past 40 years of of continually making bungalow after bungalow or punjabi baroque or whatever you uh, you know Uh, so i i think the first step towards a uh, dis- uh, a different future is to break the existing rules and those are those i think we have to do very uh, you have to do it in a way which which also makes the establishment realize that uh, the breaking of rules is going to be good for the environment good for a future and and i i am particularly reminded of a dda competition some some years ago uh, which which was which was called an ideas competition uh, but they gave very specific uh, setbacks what materials are to be used how high the building could go and what uh, you know what uh, other technologies were to be used right down to the size of rooms so what kind of an ideas competition can you have when the rules are so cleanly defined for you so i think that is where we 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 need to uh, we need to disturb the status quo and this book is very important because it it begins to disturb it and it should begin to disturb these uh, the status quo not amongst just architects but amongst bureaucrats amongst politicians and among, amongst uh, city officials i think bijoy would have had uh, something interesting to add over her because his entire essay is based on this idea that things change right um and he kind of draws this parallel uh, between two projects and one of his own projects which is the the bangalore international center starts with that it it was a competition entry they won it for the reason of it being an idea but what eventually happened is that when they had to get into construction they started to get stifled by realities right and realities being set, setbacks or budgets or this that and the rest and then what eventually what you get is something completely different um but i'm i like what you said about breaking rules and what that kind of gets to me is that we are at this point right and we also mentioned this whole idea of of covid and what the kind of state that we are in today and it's not an indian uh, issue it's not a local issue it's internationally we've all been brought to the same level uh, by this one particular virus but what's interesting is that we are at the cusp of a lot of conversations and a lot of discussions that are that are that kind of pivot around this idea of change of what was and what is going to be and in between what is happening now um i'm a little skeptical about whether we are really going to change for a very long time or is this something that's an immediate reaction and then we go back to our old ways because you know we are just people of habit um and um, what you had said something very interesting the other day about how we are very adaptable and therefore change is difficult for us um but what i also want to bring about here and i'd like both of you to respond to this idea of the immediate future and whether and the long term future and whether this time is ripe for us to make those changes and what are the kind of changes that we can really make and what is it you know what do we learn from and how do we go forward 
Ramu, would you like to respond to that? Hey, this is exactly, this is the right, I mean, I think this is the right moment. We are at the cusp of, of change. This is, if we don't make a change now, uh, due to this pandemic, uh, then when are we going to do it? Because it has shown us that many other possibilities are available to us through the technology and that the fact that you are, you are sitting in different parts of the country and talking to each other. But uh, as it comes, when it comes to architecture, so there, here we have the platform to, for change. And this, this is why it's become so interesting that this book has also come out at this moment because it gives a certain freedom of design to many architects and they have put it down with I think great gusto if you ask me. Um, the, the way that they've presented some of these buildings have been quite amazing. But the change that you talk about is something you have to look at. And the way I'd like to put it is very simple is that people are very set in their ways. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm living in Gosser and I find that everyone wants to rent a house. They want four bedrooms. They want a living space. Here they have the opportunity of coming to Goa and living free. And yet they come and are only comfortable when they move into a house which has a large living room, dining room, kitchen, et cetera. Then they venture out. So this is a kind of metaphor for what we are talking about that unless what Gautam said is that unless people do not open themselves to change, in a completely different manner, uh, given our present condition, I don't think this change will take place. And it is a different a problem between the architect and the and the you know client, as uh, Gautam put it. The restrictions are too great, and I think it's time now for these restrictions to be lifted in some manner. So this is, would be my take on this. It's um, you, and I'm going to quote something that you've written before, um, or what you've said. Uh, Ramu, you said that what remains of a civilization is its art and architecture, while wars and while wars and search for power are ephemeral. The buildings endure, right? And you illustrate this. You go on to illustrate this using the example of Hindu temples and the the, the decorations on the temples and how they're tiered. Um, and I find it interesting because you say that you know the, it, your approach to design has been eternal. So you're still talking about civilization. You're talking about changing at that level of civilization. And what, what most conversations today are um, centered around is what is sort of immediate, right? Uh, everyone's talking about working from home and whether it's from Goa or, you know, working on vacation. Uh, while Gotham has actually um, made an interesting note in, in, I think this was the forward of the book. And you kind of talk about work from home versus live in office. Gautam? Yes. Uh, you know, this is... Potential uh, over there, perhaps? <laughs> well, I, I was hoping that one would get clients to, to bite into it and and we get a an office building to work on in which, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, large offices are converted into to live in live in offices where a small, small apartments are actually inserted into um, in, into an office space, uh, but unfortunately that didn't happen, and uh, and I think it it uh, didn't happen partly because of what we were talking about that uh, we are um, we are an adaptive culture, and we would be happy to work on the dining table at home rather than you know look at an architectural possibility of uh, uh, coming out of the pandemic. And I think this is this is the crucial thing because uh, you know whenever uh, a natural disaster strikes, which uh, which of course this is a, this is a sort of a disaster um, and and uh, something which would make us see see red. Um, there are two ways to react to it. You know, one is is to uh, accept that that the world has changed and you you work radically to. Uh, see what would be the best position, best architectural position to take uh, when you when you see those changes. And the second, I think, is that you 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 just see the disaster and you sort of bury yourself deeper in, under the quilt. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I think we are uh, we as a culture 
uh, would prefer to just stay with our heads in the sand and hope that when we stick stick it back out, uh, the world will restore itself to a an earlier earlier normal. But the normal has has uh, um, it did return, but it hasn't returned fully. And now I think the uncertainty is even more so because uh, a third wave is predicted and a fourth wave may be predicted. So. As uh, Ramu was mentioning, I think this becomes a very good time to really look at, uh, you know, what possible changes can be made in in the world around us, and to to uh, to have somebody physically carry those changes out. Uh, I think one of the things I, in my uh, forward, uh, I was taking some rather extreme and maybe ridiculous positions, but. Uh, that is really with the idea of uh, provoking and not really to uh, to say that you know buses should start growing uh, trees and uh, tre trees on them or we should start planting uh, vegetables along uh, railway tracks and at at airports uh, uh, i mean that may be a future that we don't know about yet but uh, those are things that you know, unless we actually, uh, as architects, we draw those things out, we Photoshop them, and we make people aware that there are other scenarios which we can uh, we can we can work with, not just always be desperate to return to an old 1980s normal, and and that's that's I think where where architects become very important and very crucial in in uh, you know as as answerable in a way to the pandemic. Um, I think what's also that I keep noticing is that this the term imagination is recurring, um, whether when we talk about it in context of the book or what we talk what we're talking about now, even when we talk about this, the idea of change um, over the pandemic or even otherwise, you know, if you talk about long term change where with respect to civilizations like uh, Ramo mentioned. Um, but we're always we're trying to imagine things, right? And what I hear often is that we need to start looking beyond what can be done. So we are trying to we're trying to imagine a fantastical future for ourselves at some level, right? But where does that responsibility lie, if I may ask? Who are the people who are actually going to make this change? It's one thing to sit and talk about it, and it's one thing to plan it. But when do we start building that or unbuilding it for that matter, right? Is it the people who are in the book who have shown these projects and who have talked about it? Um, are we looking at authorities? Are we looking at organizations? But where do we start this project, uh, this process? Well, I think we we have to start actually with the imagination, like you you mentioned, uh, because that word is is so critical in a, at a time of the pandemic. You have to sort of literally use imagination to to create uh, some uh, future scenarios which unless say we, we do something which is uh, far-fetched and it's made aware to bureaucrats or to other people in uh, in public life uh, there has there has to be a start somewhere and I think that's where uh, architectural works uh, that stretch themselves and then become uh, you know, become public, uh, do do make a difference. And I think a book like this, for instance, would make a difference if it does have a wider uh, circulation amongst uh, people who are in decision-making uh, circles. And and uh, uh, I remember when, you know, we, we were asked to do a, a, a small proposal for a civic center, a district civic center in Delhi, uh, it was a standard kind of building with uh, with offices. People would would need to go there to pay their utility bills or to pay, pay their property tax. Uh, uh, but one of the things that uh, that we were suggesting was that the ground floors, two floors below, uh, should become uh, public floors. Uh, for um, I think we even inserted a swimming pool there along with a cafeteria and a, uh, and, a, and a club, so that it becomes a, you know, it changes the way that you perceive a, 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 an office or a government. Yeah. Office. 
but it was immediately rejected. They said, you know, we don't have money for for something like this. So, so I think it's it's uh, it's not an easy thing to make the change when when you live with a certain regulated form of building for the past uh, sixty years or seventy years since independence. Uh, but somewhere, I think uh, someone has to start, and I think uh, architects with their own projects can are the first ones to really try it. I don't know what Ramu thinks about that. But actually, uh, Gautam, the point is that uh, architects are not the people. While you you know we design a lot of things and we try to solve urban problems and other uh, uh, matters related to uh, building. It's not the architect who starts the process of change. If you look historically, it is the uh, people in power and what they want. Let's say even Imperial Delhi, which when it was started, it wasn't the architect who, he was there, he was invited to build this magnificent building. Yeah. But the fact is that they want to impose Imperial power. To, in, to India and show that this is a mighty nation. Now that is the basis on which the architects have to react. It's not the other way around. Architects cannot tell anyone what to do. It yeah. is somehow uh, a historical process, wherever you look, whether it's East or West, <laughs> always the, uh, the visionary uh, who takes on the job, or even if you take the whole fascist programs in Europe when Mussolini and, uh, and uh, Hitler were in power, they virtually changed the way architects worked and produced buildings because they wanted to show a kind of uh, uh, mighty power. So that is my point about architects. I think we are secondary to the process of change. And I think it's important. The change is not really in our hands. We react to change. That yeah one way of looking at it <laughs> no that's uh, I, I think that's that's um, that's a very realistic view because even um, you know many years ago this uh, American president Johnson Lyndon Johnson proposed uh, something a great idea it was called the great society and it was in reference to um, to how change could be brought into American cities uh, you know they it's Obviously, done with the idea of elim eliminating poverty in uh, the inner cities, uh, in increasing education, urban reform. Uh, but at the core of it, he also they also addressed uh, they examined ways that cities should be planned so that ghettos are not uh, part of it. Uh, opening up the ghettos so it it integrates with the rest of the city, and and. Uh, one of the things I remember from reading that manifesto of the Great Society was that there was also a, a place for role for the role of beauty in urban and civic life. I mean, do, uh, I think we, unless we begin to address such esoteric sort of topics uh, and we get get people to to not think of lumping architecture as a as part of the problems of India, you know, we think of, of architecture only as a as a problem solving uh, medium. You know, housing is there. There is a need for for thirty million houses, and only three million have been built. So, so if when you put that rider onto architecture, it it, it grossly changes the idea of of beauty ever coming into the picture because you you're uh, approaching it from a position of mistrust mm -hmm. you, you add add uh, the forces of economy and uh, cheap structure and all that but i mean those are very essential uh, parts of it but uh, but you know by divorcing uh, ideas of beauty and of of, uh, of lifestyle and of Living, what kind of living do, uh, do poorer people in the city have? All those things were, were part of this great society program, you know, which which 
or this Lyndon Johnson had initiated in the late 60s, I think, or early 60s. And, you know, so un, like you're saying, Ramu, I think it's, if we get, uh, if something like that, uh, a major initiative which comes out of politics or uh, some bureaucrat actually thinks of it, uh, um, architects are unlikely to, I mean, there's no way uh, you or I or any of the, the, the hundreds of very talented people who are in the book, if they initiate something like this, it, it can't go ahead unless, uh, unless there is serious backing, financial backing as well as political backing. Right. Right. So we seem to be kind of going around in circles with the same thing, right? I mean, uh, what you're saying, Gautam, about having all these restrictions and doing all of this, what we end up doing as architects, we end up doing the bare minimum that we can, right? Yeah. We are not, we don't have the, the, we have the potential, but not necessarily the opportunity to go beyond that, whether it's in expression, whether it's in provision or whatever it might be. We're just providing the bare minimum service that can be given in order for something to pass, you know, it's again, yeah. bare minimum need and function. Um, but do you think that we have a voice as a collective? I mean, that's that's one way to start, right? And that's one of the that one of the purposes of the book, if I if I may say, is to bring people together and to talk about these things. Today, architecture, um, it's let's say in household discussions, it's probably it translates into infrastructure. It probably translates into um, functional sort of provisions that people are, you know, like like you said, your public buildings, your government institutes, and things like that. But as a community, can we get together and as a collective, can we put our voice together and move the ball further? Or is it that are we always going to get stuck at saying that, you know, there's some authority who's going to put a roadblock or there's going to be a budget that's not going to be met? How do we overcome those hindrances? Ramu, from your years well, of experience. Uh, actually, you know, to be a completely on a tangent on this, you, uh, what was uh, I was thinking about is that yes, the restriction will continue talking about. But if you think about the, I often look outside an aeroplane and you'll see the growth of various um, uh, little settlements spread all over India and other parts of the world, and you find that it is always very organic and unplanned. It's like almost like a plant that is growing, whether it's small villages or the small townships and so on. The point I'm trying to make is that the, uh, the necessity of architects is also now being questioned. You know, the book, the book uh, Architecture Without Architects. So we have to uh, understand that uh, architects, uh, it's a very tricky business because have, if you introduce the fact that architecture can be done without architects, then you're in a different ball game. And you know, um, we make certain rules and with buildings and the unbuilt and so on. But uh, when you start looking at a large number of buildings that have been built, and some of them, which are very, very beautiful as the book, Architecture Without Architects shows us, uh, then we have to question the whole, let it just, it's just being a little uh, difficult. I'm trying to be a little difficult in this discussion because lead us into another area of, of, of looking at our imposing. You see, we are also imposing people. It's not that we are the, that is the authorities that are speak to us. Architects have a great tendency to impose their will. And they do believe that what they are doing is right. Sometimes they are right. But most of the times they are having a tough time in today's world. You know, and so they end up with these huge and massive buildings that sometimes are not making sense to me at least, but it's making sense to a number of people. You know, so that that is where it is a very strange moment we are. On the one hand, no architecture, and the other hand, you know, the skyscrapers of Dubai. So Architects also have a role beyond building, right? Yeah. About provoking thought, about challenging certain norms. Exactly. They have those responsibilities as well. So that, that's, where, that's where we have to 
uh, agree at some point where our role is, you know, and how much we can provoke and how much we can allow the, both the civilization and nature to take its course. So we have to question ourselves at every moment. I, I think we can't allow ourselves at, at this time when we are thinking of change and we're trying to provoke change then we, as Gautam says, we have to get away from the uh, norms that are being thought about. So we go back to that old question of how do we get away from authority, from, uh, you know, rules. So this is something we have to think about uh, very seriously. Yeah, I, I think it's, I'm sorry, it, it, um, your point, I think, is... Uh, of architecture without architects is something which which forms a very crucial part of, of any discussion, I think, on architecture in India, because so much of architecture in India is done without architects. Uh, you know, it's not just the people who are building in rural areas, but uh, the faceless architect who builds thousands of housing projects and big, uh, you know, uh, Decision makers as well. Very large government buildings also, and all across India. So the actual uh, uh, potential to make the change uh, mm -hmm. is being discussed really amongst the very few, maybe one percent of of uh, the of the uh, of the kind of building which is done across the country. And I think this is uh, the the crucial question: is uh, why do we build so much? Uh, we are one of the most overbuilt countries on earth, you know, and yet we are continually building. You know, we, we are, uh, we've got um, 30 million in India which need to be housed, and every day there is some statistic being thrown at you that we need more building and more, uh, more highways. You know, six-lane highways are, are now connecting the metros. There are um, highways connecting the char dhams. There is an industrial corridor being considered between Delhi and uh, and Gujarat. Uh, and and there is uh, you know fragile mountainsides that all are being eroded. There's uh, um, there's reduced tree covers, and and all that is happening. Uh, without too much gain, uh, I'm not saying that these are all inessential things, but uh, what happens is that we need as architects to, to perhaps question why we build so much and why should we continually be building and shouldn't we be, I, I think the wrong notion that architecture is always associated with a consumption of building. You know, we are we have to build more, and 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 I think in our practices also, there's a tendency to build more than what the uh, client wants, and, and give a partly, of course, to collect more fees, but uh, uh, it's also there to uh, we are you know our it's it's now a, a very big ecological issue. It's a, it's very much of a moral issue. Why should so much of India be destroyed because, uh, you know, because construction is required and 30 million people need to be housed and more offices need to be built. Um, I think that this whole notion that, that, that architects now should begin to look at accommodation, possible accommodation through landscape and through a changing way of, of, uh, of building altogether, maybe doing I don't know, living in trees or living, uh, living some, uh, you know, finding finding a different mode of construction than the than the conventional one, and so I so I think that is a that's a very big if in in what the profession should be doing. Do you think, and if I may ask both of you, um, that you know, architects are are like you said, meant to build, and you're trying to you're providing for the people. But do you think there could be a sort of offshoot of that or a vertical of that, which looks at actually unbuilding? And over here, I mean it in a more literal sense, um, not, and you know, of course, like this whole idea of the adaptive reuse has come up, uh, has gained a lot of popularity and a lot of architects are leading towards that. 
um, but there is a lot of built um, infrastructure or a lot of built material that is lying defunct and is not being used. Absolutely. Who 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 caters? Who not caters? Who addresses that? Do we start like a separate segment of architecture that starts to look at what needs to be unbuilt or needs to be brought down or needs to be redone in a certain way? I I don't know who can who begins this uh, this task because it is a very major uh, major point and it also needs. to be clarified uh, you know on a national scale and it it's uh, it's you know it, it goes much beyond just uh, saving some monuments and uh, and altering uh, changing a, a palace into a hotel because those those are adaptations that we've been doing for the last 30 years now the the question is the the adaptation should uh, really be addressing Say the um, there there are about uh, about three lakh houses in mm. in Gurgaon, for instance, and in other parts of Bangalore and in uh, and in Mumbai, uh, which are lying vacant, uh, vacant, as you said. You know, there's it has. Uh, why should those not be used to house house people? Uh, why can't we also? Uh, I mean, the homeless in Delhi, for instance, could, should they be? be allowed to use the parked cars at night as their as their their shelters i mean so yeah, i mean it's a it's a maybe a silly um, radical position but uh, um, unless unless there are ways in which we can build much less you know and uh, that i think is a crucial crucial question uh, for for the country and i think it's uh, it'd be interesting to see that in the long run there should be the architecture practices that actually build less are the better practices less meaning they they accommodate they find innovative ways to adapt uh, existing buildings but uh, but the question of which buildings to adapt and how this can be done has to take on the bureaucracy and that is something that we are not in a position to do Ramit, do you think that architecture has become nostalgic for us, for us architects? And not that, not I'm, I'm saying, do you, yeah. Do you think architecture becomes nostalgic for architects, and we are unable to let go of what we have built? I think that's absolutely right. I think we tend to, you know, in the end, when we are faced with all these complex issues, we fall back. on our design capability and then produce something which we enjoy doing and you know uh, so we uh, let ourselves into that realm uh, because we cannot face the real uh, what's going on because you do have some of some very beautiful buildings in cities and not parts of the world but the large majority as gautam said is a it needs inspiration of some kind you know the the you know the suburbs of kanpur or of nagpur or of uh, you know hyderabad are the same you know there's no inspiration and why why that's why architects uh, resort back to their skills and go back to some beautiful buildings that they produce for themselves and that if that is nostalgia then i think i agree with you it, it is a bit like that i mean what can one do Uh, when we are faced let's let's not if we're not discussing at this uh, at this uh, level of of design then then where do we go because we know at outside what's going on you know and we it is it is driving through kilometer after kilometer of of these uninspirational buildings you know you have to just leave bangalore and for 20 kilometers you're faced with one set of concrete buildings after another not very high like gorgao is just goes on and on and on it's just some form of shelter so what is the poor architect who believes and is slightly idealistic still the young architect he still wants to contribute something so yes i do agree that you know we escape into that quite happily uh because yes, so that that would be <laughs> the position of a young architect. Like where does he go? 
I find that fascinating and, you know, have had multiple dialogues about this, this idea of how young idealistic architects want to build, right? And then there's this conundrum that, what is it that you're building? And then the other side of it saying that, should you be building at all? Then why did you become an architect, right? That's right. So do we say that this profession doesn't need to exist anymore? Or, but there is so much more that architects need to do and can do besides just building, right? Um, and I'm going to pull us back a little bit to the book because the book itself is, it's been defined as a collective of thoughtful ideas that address relevant issues of innovation and in design technology conservation. It also becomes an opportunity to provoke thoughts and to, it becomes a catalyst to have conversations. Um, Gautam, would you like to, to comment on this and talk a little bit about just this idea of bringing in so many young idealistic um, architects to contribute to something like this? Why is it important to have a conversation like this? No, no, I, uh, I think that's, uh, that's, that's very critical because uh, the young architects are the ones who will take us into the future and future scenarios really depend on the way they uh, think about architecture. And, and so I, I think maybe we, um, Ramu and I and uh, not you, uh, but the uh, part of a generation that saw construction as essential to architecture. Uh, but the young, I think the younger architects have a much broader view of, uh, of, of building. You know, it's, it's almost like, um, like Instagram, you, you put it up and if there is a hologram of a building and you can occupy it for a, for a while, um, they are less concerned about the eternal qualities of, of building. I, I mean, I'm making this uh, as, a, as a vague generalization. I, I, I'm sure that's not the case. If I may interrupt, do you mean eternal qualities or are you talking more about the tangible values of building? Well, uh, both that, that, you know, we, uh, when, uh, whenever we've done buildings, it's always with heavy stone and, and brick and concrete, which which is meant to kind of last as long as uh, you know Akbar's tomb, uh, and and uh, the 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 younger uh, lot I think see um, see sort of or accept uh, the these ideas that that maybe that's not the only material that's not the only technology that's available to them, and they don't you don't care whether the building lasts. Uh, the, 30 years or it last, uh, last 400 years. So I think in, in a sense, what is happening now is that, uh, uh, you know, they, I was looking at, at other professions. If you, if you look at, say, a, a botanist, he's, he or she is an enabler in a way. They understand uh, certain things about plants and all that. And they, they work towards enabling a, a science of, of planting the surgeon is a is a kind of a corrector you know his, his position is is such that he he or she moves the body parts into the right alignment and do the cutting as well as so there's no addition in a way to, uh, to, to the fabric of whatever they're working in uh, the architect is a maker and a producer and so I think in, in some ways, the younger architects are now mm, becoming more in, enablers and, and correctors, or they need to be, become botanists and, and surgeons, because I think the future of architecture actually depends on, on uh, surgery of the city and of, uh, of uh, a kind of botany where you, where you look at landscape, which is... Uh, uh, so, so I think in that sense, uh, maybe maybe the future is not as not so bleak if if people like Ramu and I are uh, allowed to build in the cities. Same but way. if the younger lot are doing it, it'll it'll become a, a, you know we may learn to live with with the with the less with a more transient kind of building and a more uh, and a more I, interesting I, I and more imaginative uh, future. In this book, uh, there are instances of yeah. this happening. There, a, there yeah. are a lot of projects that are talking about a more, uh, a, you know, a, a sort of uh, temporary mm. 
structure. Mm. Yeah. I think every structures and Instagram, as you rightly put it, is the way forward. And the, the younger architects are going to look at architecture, not like uh, not like stone and vistas and all these other things that we were brought up with. They are going to uh, start looking at uh, at uh, different ways of envisaging just space, even if it's in the form of a um, three-dimensional building, which doesn't exist. I mean, now holograms, as you rightly put, or we can walk through uh, buildings now virtually. So these things are going to be very important in the way we look at buildings. And it's good that we are recognizing this. And, and this mm -hmm. book definitely is beginning to see, uh, show this. But I think the next book uh, will definitely get out of the, the uh, solidity of buildings and go into the, uh, the, the non-existence of I think that's what's going to happen. Um, it's yeah, interesting. I mean, I'm it may not sorry. people need to go to get away from. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I was just uh, reacting to, to Ramu's uh, uh, idea about the solidity of building. And I, I mean, solidity of building is, is not altogether bad if it's carried out with a certain. Um, you know, respect for the landscape and all. And I was thinking of, you know, the even the the uh, Norm Foster viaduct across uh, in uh, uh, Milo or some 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 place in France where the the viaduct actually occupies a space in the air, and it is it is and it is the first time it's like an aerial architecture altogether because the uh, life, uh, traditional life at the base of uh, the viaduct carries on much the way it always has. But the introduction of this hugely technocratic uh, uh, step towards crossing a valley uh, makes that into such a wonderful piece of, of architecture because it allows uh, almost a 22nd century technology to exist with the uh, an 18th century uh, ground condition, you know, where people are still walking around and with uh, or cycling uh, down below and completely un undisturbed. So I think the future of architecture actually depends on on conserving so much of what we have, but also building in a way which which doesn't destroy it at all, doesn't doesn't need to alter it in in any radical way, but does it in a in a completely fleeting kind of uh, sort of master mastery of uh, of, a, of a different sort. sort. Uh, what you said, Gautam, reminded me of the aqueducts in Rome, and you've got you've got the aqueducts that kind of span across the countryside, but then you've got the Romas yeah. that actually occupy them at the lower level and the ground level, and they've been doing that for centuries, right? And they continue to do that. There's this entire parallel civilization in Italy um, that is that is occupying this space. Yeah. Uh, but what I also want to touch upon what you said earlier about architects doing things other than building. And I think that becomes important and that's, it's encouraging to see more and more architects doing that. And I've seen um, with both of you, in fact, the fact that both of you have written books and continue to write books, I think becomes an interesting and critical expression of your work as architects. Um, we find more and more architects are finding different um, the values in expressing themselves in different ways, whether it's through photography, through writing, through anything, right? Um, I've done that myself. I'm an architect. Like, I don't build anymore, but I do. I continue to call myself an architect. Um, for me, provo provoking thought, for me, trying to question the norm, trying to understand what is happening, why it's happening, and challenging that. I think that is equally important. It's important for anyone in any field to be doing that, to forward research, for, for example, whether you're talking about medicine or science or anything. It's not always um, the surgeon who's doing the cutting and the moving around, but there's this entire sort of research and scientific team that enables him to do it, right? And I think that becomes an important part of the process as well. And I, I do wanna ask both of you as authors of several books each, why did you find it uh, important to express yourself through written word? 
and why was it critical for you to actually publish books ramu well uh, exactly the, you know we were not able to build in the manner we wanted to and so we started looking at areas of expertise that needed to be explored uh, my first book which was the kerala temple uh, looked at the way that they built and such absolutely magnificent building and scale and proportion all that came in so well that one started studying that because we uh, we were not able we didn't have the chance to uh, to be able to express ourselves fully uh, and so we then resorted at least i did i resorted to a traditional form of building a building that has been uh, tested for centuries so i said why where does this lead to and this is where the kerala temple definitely uh, provides and it uh, it doesn't change you see we change over decades mm. whereas the temple to, uh, over the last 4 500 years still remains very much the same although they are all different and they each of them has their individual design their way of putting it together but yet they follow a norm that provides a very pleasing result and this modern architecture unfortunately uh, has a problem and which is what we all confront we are not able to provide uh, all the time a pleasing result perhaps that is the may the reason why we venture out to other areas of exploration Gautam, your books have been very different. I can't imagine Punjabi Baroque being something that you wanted to do but didn't do, and therefore wrote a book on. So, can you hear? Can you hear us? I'm sorry, you have to repeat it. I uh, missed that. Uh, no, I'm uh, saying your your approach to writing about architecture, I'm sure, is very different. It, uh, I'm sure it's different to not being able to do something and therefore writing about it because you've written a lot. and a lot of your work comes uh, falls under the genre satire so where does that come from <laughs> uh, and not again i have to say not just uh, i think uh, more than your books it's your sculptural work and your artistic work that really uh, speaks to me personally <laughs> yes uh, firstly mirali i i think uh, the you know you you said that you are an architect and you also um you provoke through a lot of your questioning which you which you bring to to larger discussion groups and i think that is really the crux of what uh, what you know why architecture needs to be questioned and and i think you do it uh, admirably well uh, but my own approach is also very different from ramu's um, because uh, i have known ramu for for many years 30 years or something like that and and somehow his his way of uh, practice is also very distinct from other architects because it, <coughs> excuse me he's been engaged in uh, you know looking at sculpture painting um, poetry uh, craft and for many years we lived sort of uh, in the same neighborhood and i would visit him but i would there was there was never any uh, there was no, nothing about the house which uh, or his his uh, his interiors which which told you that he was an architect because there was so much of of the artistic life expressed in so many different uh, different ways so so i think his writing is also very similar as i think his latest uh, book uh, looks at that uh, buildings uh, only through the way he is he has experienced them and he has experienced the art in the building you maybe even imagine poetry in the building uh, so all that has come out in a way which is not a biography of of an architect it's a biography of uh, of a person who is in employed in looking at architecture and poetry and many other things uh and i think that that makes his his uh, his biography very interesting because it uh, architecture is only a by product of what what his uh, what his own life is is all about uh, my view has been completely different and i came to writing really 
when I first started only when I didn't have much work and I just come back from uh, from uh, studying abroad uh, so <clears throat> the first project that we got was was a, a group of uh, brothers who wanted to wanted us to um, even though I started an office they were the ones who said that they would like me to build uh, Build for them Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's house, outside uh, outside Delhi, and so it was. Uh, you know, it was the only chance. It was the first chance of actually doing a building, and it was a building I didn't want to do, because I didn't want to sort of take, uh, you know, take uh, Jefferson's house and build it in uh, suburban Delhi. So, uh, so what was what turned into what was meant to be an architecture project turned into a writing exercise. And I tried all through to to try and get them to convince me why Thomas Jefferson's house was so critical for for them and uh, to be built in Delhi. So the this uh, book actually the first book actually came out of such experiences. You know. Uh, Somebody or the other wanting to to build something really uh, ludicrous, and uh, and and so I my uh, writing actually started with uh, with the record of of uh, the ludicrous ideas, which I think later uh, uh, you know developed into a sort of satire because so much of of Indian life uh, is actually satire. You, you see certain things which happen uh, in the newspapers and you find that they're so funny and they, they really are uh, what's recording. Uh, so it's, so it, the satirical part of it actually was something that, that grew out of the early experiences of architecture and not the other way around. But it's interesting because that's also led to so many conversations about architecture in India, right? Um, and a lot of people who are the con who are consumers of the books and this goes for both Ramu and Gautam, they those become just springboards for conversations. They become starting points for various things, um, and I think that it's interesting to see Unbuilt do that as well. Um, what's been fascinating is uh, is that it's not only an opportunity over the last few year, few days that you know they've been having a lot of these conversations and chats online. But um, hopefully this becomes a catalyst to have more conversations and to allow people to discuss ideas at a broader level, to actually challenge what they are doing themselves or what is happening around them. And to, you know, look at perhaps, look at the fantastical, look at something, uh, start to, to look at what dystopia or utopia means for everyone. What is, what are the tenses? What is the past, present and the future? Are we building on the past, are we looking at what we require in the present? Are we looking at, you know, what the future is going to be? Is it going to be different to what it is today? Um, I don't know. When we were, I remember when I, I mentioned this in our last chat as well, that, you know, when we were at the cusp of the, the turning of the century, everyone would say, oh, so what would you imagine, let's say, 20 years into the century? And everyone would be like, oh, we want flying cars. Well, you know, we're a little far from flying cars today. But... And you might get slapped with reality in between, but the point is that you have to think of it for it to happen. If you don't ask, you don't get. If you don't think, you can't make. So perhaps this becomes that opportunity. It becomes a chance for all of us to start thinking, to start looking at um, various options. And I think what's been really encouraging from both of you is that, um, first of all, Rajesh, you, you have to do a third book. I, I think that you know, it's been taken for granted throughout this conversation that there's a third book coming. So congratulations yeah. on that. Um, and I think what's also interesting is to, to kind of instigate this idea of what that could involve and what that could mean. And therefore get the ball rolling, get people to start thinking about what uh, potential they all have, right? Um, I think uh, we are actually at the close of this discussion. This could go on forever. It's, it's fascinating to talk about these things, um, but there is a book to be launched. And uh, we're all waiting for that. And I think um, it's, it's been long sort of anticipated by everyone over here. Um, so thank you so much, Gautam and Ramu, for joining us. Uh, just a quick thing. Do we have some time for questions or if anybody has questions? Yeah. So uh, there is Aditi waiting for, uh, she wants to ask a question. So Aditi, you are. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah. 
Aditi, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, there you are. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Gautam. Hi, Aditi. Hi. Hi, Anurud. Hello. Uh, we just flew in last night and uh, decided to attend this. Um, so one of the things I know we've been talking about the unbuilt and how to reimagine architecture. You know, in fact, as we were flying to um, the airport, um, one of the things that came to my mind was, you know, early in the pandemic when everything went to lockdown, our house, which is not large, had to become a school, you know, an office and a studio. So, and all the office spaces in San Francisco were completely empty, right? And then there's homelessness in San Francisco. So I think that, I mean, what that made me think about um, architecture is not a specific function, but as a, you know, maybe the future of architecture because, you know, such pandemics and uh, climate change with, you know, bad air quality days, et cetera, et cetera, is going to um, probably see more of us doing different things from what we call our home. And so that should probably translate into how office spaces are used as well, because there's so much empty real estate right now. And I was wondering if that sort of um, kind of builds into the, or addresses the idea of the unbuilt, like how do we the spaces are not like, you know, categorically defined as defined for a specific function. And so we need to reimagine design so that it's not for a specific function. Now, Jen, just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Uh, who is this addressed to other people? I guess you, I just said hi, <laughs> or anybody else who wants to. Okay. Uh, no, I know. I think that's a, that's um, that really is a, a critical question right now. I think facing um, not so much architects, but uh, but uh, many bureaucrats who who have to sort of uh, learn to who who sort of realize that the empty shell of many buildings has to be put to to a more imaginative use. Right. Uh, but the 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 problem with the, with something like uh, the, you know the, the pandemic is that unless it asserts itself on a in a in a more forceful way, which I hope it doesn't, uh, <laughs> uh, it uh, we are likely not to do anything about these things. So I, I think in the long run, uh, what we need is a is a five year long pandemic, which which makes us really think of you know how architects. Uh, can actually resolve some of these this conundrum of uh, of empty shells of office spaces and uh, so I, it's uh, it's not suggesting that we we continue with the pandemic but the the chance of an answer uh, of an architectural answer coming I think is is seems to me very remote uh, and I don't know what uh, Rinalini or Ramu uh, think of this. Ramu, would you like to add something? Uh, no, I wanted to just, uh, on a lighter note, actually, uh, he, uh, Gautam said we've known each other for years and years, and that's very really true. And I tend to be very staid and, and have nothing to do. And so whenever I need a little bit of light entertainment, I used to go across to um, Gautam's um, place and spend an evening with him. But, you know, his satire is extremely serious, as you know. Uh, but uh, just to tell you, because we've been talking, he has actually written a note of, I think he's writing a novel, which hasn't, has it come out yet, Gautam, with the one day autobiography of a sofa, having an affair with a table lamp or something like that. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so I don't know whether that's come out or not, but it's quite important you know, to, uh, to, this, to talk about these uh, objects and their lives, you know. Uh, which you, I think, had put together at some stage. Has it come out yet? Uh, it hasn't come out, Ramu, because uh, you know the the uh, 
there is a murder between the between the table lamp and the sofa and some other chairs have also gotten into the act so it's a it's a very complex uh, storyline <laughs> unless we resolve it it's it's going to remain uh, as a manuscript but i i've enjoyed doing this something which has taken me away from from standards that i completely and i think this is uh, uh, some I'm, uh, i've been encouraged by uh, ramu and a few others who who read it uh, but it's uh, uh, let's hope it comes out one of these days if i can comment um, on what aditi said earlier and just tying it with what you're saying gotham i think it's interesting to also look at architecture as product because that is what we are building and start to consider its lifespan uh each of these things that we are building right what is its its use and what is its lifespan um when we were talking about the pandemic so when we went especially when we went to the second wave in april i was thinking about all these empty multi story flats at the you know the outskirts of noida greater noida that area you've got these matchbox houses that are just springing all over the place and they were just lying vacant and mm-hmm. here your the delhi government is struggling and fighting every day to build isolation camps now it was there a possibility to use this existing infrastructure for something like this which was a requirement of the hour it was a need of the hour and they they were desperately trying to find accommodation for people right so instead of going into these large um fields and and starting to pitch tents was it pos- was it possible to start talking to these big corporates and starting to use their infrastructure which was ready lying vacant and you know temporarily sort of transform that into a camp or a medical facility or whatever it may be um these are questions that do crop up but if we keep looking at architecture as this nostalgic piece of creation i think that in some level it blinds us and you know we can't look beyond that we can't we need to start looking at it as beyond a shelter or beyond a home for a couple or you know all of that we if we start kind of um delabeling it at some level we might be more open to other ideas or might be more flexible to its understanding perhaps just might do bit yeah um, so you got them go ahead no i know i was uh, i i think this is this is the thing that uh, who is the person who uh, begins to uh, to bring the the architect to the to to the camp and or or the other way around to make uh, such realities uh, you know possible now how do you draw draw someone into uh, understanding that all this emptiness can be occupied very crucially at a time when when it's needed um, so i think it's uh, it, the the element of of risk is something which is which is critical in 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 uh, the kind of decision making uh, process and the people who actually make those decisions are the ones who need to be reminded maybe by architects that these this potential does exist and i think that that's where the book becomes a, becomes a very important uh, conduit for you know for that message yeah exactly um any other questions from the audience uh, rajesh from zoom or from i think we are also streaming across platforms so anybody who has any co- comments or questions anyone uh, yeah there is one more message from aditi aditi you can uh, just speak up that's completely fine you can unmute yourself and I mean um going back to what Gotham had said about hopefully we won't be in this pandemic for a long time um I mean epidemiologists you know predict that there will actually be more pandemics and more severe pandemics because of loss of habitat which brings us much closer to um animals that had their own habitat and now they're they've lost their habitat so they're going to be closer to human beings and there's going to be more transfer of germs etc so um again going back to the question of i think what the point that you raised about you know empty lots being quickly put or converted to some other use 
which would serve the need of the moment? And how does that, um, I mean, I know Gautam said he sees a lot of hope in the future, but could there be, you know, I know there's the, you know, different architectural groups or, you know, the board that gives architects their licenses. So could they play a part in kind of relaxing bylaws or, re or reimagining bylaws, I guess, is a better question. Yeah, you know, Aditi, I, you know, this, this whole uh, debate uh, would be very different if architects were actually sociologists. And the trouble is design has kind of taken over so completely uh, as, a, as an instrument in itself and a medium in itself. Uh, so the display of design uh, seems, to, seems to make um, architects sort of, um, you know, a, a very different breed from sociologists. Whereas uh, uh, I think the earlier resolve actually of the profession was to was to use um, sociology, social work, and and a sort of a, um, you know a kind of people centric view to evolve uh, buildings or ideas for building. And I think uh, because of this uh, differentiation, uh, we now don't even you know consider um, social workers or or social extending ourselves into into such situations you know and that that I think is uh, maybe where the problem lies Rama would you like to add anything that doesn't no. answer your question but it uh... not really I think you know I think uh, it's one could continue as you say talking about various issues in fact, one, my thought was about uh, Aditi's question was there's a movie now that's a serial that has come out on Netflix where people have occupied an unused um, hospital and they're taking over areas to um, uh, start living in them and they've created, you know, living spaces, which are nothing to do with bedrooms or bathrooms. They just use the common bathroom. So it's quite fascinating to answer her question that uh, uses are being put. And in fact, that they are not allowed to have parties, but they have a big party in this. I mean, that's part of the, this, uh, uh, the uh, movie. But it's interesting that, uh, that squatters have taken over and it's not, you don't need to plan it. It just happens when there's some empty space, people will take it over. Uh, there's actually this reminds me of a um, they do this in in London if I'm not mistaken they have these yeah. old warehouses mm -hmm. and originally what was happening is that they were all lying vacant and squatters would come in and take over and start to live there illegally and then they regularized it That's and right. so what they've done is that and a lot of these spaces are used by creatives so you have musicians you have artists you have architects so creative minds that are coming together they occupy the space and they have um, they do a lot of collaborative projects but I think, and again, if I'm not mistaken, one of the clauses is that if the developer needs the space at any given point of time, you'll have a very short notice period to vacate. But until they actually come to that point of uh, reinstating that warehouse or the factory for a, another use, you, mm -hmm. it is used for residential, you know, for a lot of them who are homeless or low income or um, students or people living on budgets and of course they have like different typologies and uh, different scales of it yes. but I thought that was a fabulous idea right at least you're yes. using built infrastructure and you're providing shelter to people who need it but I guess like we're, we're talking about architecture being more dexterous and being a little more sort of uh, adaptive and flexible in, in the future um, perhaps Rajesh we can see some of this in the next book too you're getting a lot of ideas of what can come into know, yeah. 3.0 <laughs> So, we have discussed, that so every discussion is bringing up this Unbuilt 3.0 and I started thinking about it even before Unbuilt 2.0 is completely out. We have uh, we have Chitra Vishwanath uh, who wants to ask a question or share something. Chitra. Please. Where is she? 
Yeah, here I am. So uh, I'm uh, more taken up with what uh, Gautam said about uh, design itself being the end itself. What one is seeing, Gautam, nowadays in the institute is the drawing of the design being the end and not really even uh, conceptualizing how it will be made. So these drawings have become extremely fantastical in the colleges. And I don't know how those students will come out and will be able to make. Yes. There is a lot of unbuilt in the school curriculum. Yes, I, I think that is, a, Chitra, that's a real danger of architecture being recognized as as a visual art, which is for, for uh, immediate sale. So any form of that process by which you get to a building itself becomes like a, a record which is worth keeping and uh, preserving and selling. So, so I think so much of that I think uh, takes it takes it away from the the idea of of building itself. That uh, you yeah. uh, many architects are actually doing uh, uh, drawings as yeah. complete entities in themselves and they become you know, saleable items and uh, and are shown at galleries. Uh, this is not yeah. uh, really just an Indian idea. I mean, this has been there for, uh, I think in uh, Europe and America, the, the uh, these galleries were showing the works of artists, uh, works of architects as, as drawings themselves. Uh, so the building the building uh, came much later and maybe it never came. So the, it is yeah. it's a serious uh, problem for so, a but the, Yeah, but then it also questions is what are we making these future architects? How, how, how will they be able to make anything? Mm. If the impetus is only given in making of a drawing. Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question. I think, I think we're... <laughs> We're asking, uh, uh, asking them to actually change the way the profession is, is practiced and uh, uh, the hands-on approach that I think a lot of people, I think you, you've been very concerned with that for many years, is to, to, to bring the site uh, into, into actual, uh, not just in practice, but also in, in schools to be made aware. Yeah. Uh, construction is very much part of architecture and I think that is the only way to kind of save save the practice and and make the practice practical I suppose <laughs> thank you thank you thanks uh, I'm sorry we are going to have to limit our questions we are now kind of uh, running yeah. behind time a little bit for the book launch so if there are any other questions, please, please feel free to write them down and we'll try to get our uh, speakers to respond to you separately. Uh, Rajesh, I'm just going to put it on you saying that, you know, you kind of connect the dots. But I am going to hand over the floor to Rajesh, Gautam and Ramu. Thank you so much for a fabulous conversation, for joining us this evening and for a lot of food for thought. I hope, um, I know I am, but I, I hope uh, a large part of our audience is going back with a lot of insights and a lot of things to think about. Um, and, you know, we can have more such conversations and, and more such thought provoking chats and take some of these, make them more actionable and take them ahead. So Rajesh, uh, thank you both for being here this evening. Mm -hmm.